wet dog. This is what it looks like. Somewhere, as I sit in the rain, there's a war between cats at 3 a.m., the last man on earth leaving a voicemail that won't be heard, inception, cremation, and a tired old man sitting in his car outside his home in the rain. I can hear my dog howling to me. She knows when I come home. Dogs have that sense that lets them know when you're coming home, even if you're around the corner. When I go inside, she'll wag her whole ass and try to lick me. But her breath is 14 years gone, so I just have to pet her and kiss the little black spot that she has next to her ear. I'll forever be thankful for the night she would wait up for me, and here I am, waiting up for her. I put her to rest last week. She was named after a restaurant my father used to go to with his grandmother when he was a kid. My dog was 14. I got her when I was in second grade. But it was time. You don't know when the time comes. She'll look at you and you'll look at her, and you'll both know what needs to be done. There's a sense of peace that shreds you apart when it happens. You have to understand. This realm isn't the only one we're a part of. Don't look at it as if you're killing your dog. Look at it as if you're giving her a ticket to peace. A ticket to... The festival. There was only one thing I could think about when we were saying goodbye. In second grade, a girl asked my teacher if dog heaven was real. My teacher, Mrs. O'Brien, looked at her and just said, No. Don't be silly. At the end of that second grade year, we were all told to write our names on the board as sort of a goodbye to second grade type thing. I didn't want to write mine. After my classmates all did what they were told, I looked up at the board from my desk. The girl wrote her name on the board in green expo marker, and under her name she wrote, Dog Heaven is Real. I don't think anyone even noticed it. No one talked about it. Mackenzie is still my hero. I often wonder how she's doing. I'll be honest with you. My second grade teacher was a fucking block of dry ice. Every day she would come in with her short, fucking slob self looking like the interior of an old Buick that belonged to a family of four. She had no smell, and her hair, and what was left of it, was always straying away from her skull. Probably for good reason. She always drank three diet peach snapples, and would treat us all like a bunch of assholes. That's all I remember anymore. She was always yelling, always correcting, always fed up with us. A bunch of seven-year-olds. When teaching is cursive, if the lowercase letter T was looped like a lowercase L, she would just yell. I would cover my ears and see she scream louder. I think it all worked out in the end, because my cursive is so good, it's not even legible. My print is now so bad, it's also not even legible. Mrs. O'Brien. Patricia fucking O'Brien. She's dead now. Cancer. Lesson learned. Dog heaven is real. As the rain hits my windshield harder, I like to think that's what happens when people or someone you love dies. It just rains for a week. Maybe it's coincidence but I don't believe in them. Everything happens for a reason. Everything. If you understand the way the world works, you'll know what I mean. I don't mean to be cynical in all of this, but I do mean to be blunt. I can't imagine what a therapy session would look like. 
I've been abusing myself in the name of progress, and this is now what it looks like when you have nothing left to believe in. So you just float along. Don't worry. I'll get there. I guess at some point everything ties together. And perhaps I'm looking for a simpler time. After I transferred out of Catholic school halfway through 5th grade and moved to my local public school, and by local I mean 100 yards from my house local, I assimilated into the new group with flying colors in a season of grays and whites sprinkled with red and green. I made some friends along the way. I don't, I don't remember the sun being out that month, but as time went on and the earth became more saturated, I recall an end of the school year moment where I connected with a girl with a broken arm. For some reason, all three of our fifth grade classrooms were playing end of the year games. Thinking back, I never didn't play end of the year games until I got to college. Strange. I had been put in this cripples group who wasn't in my class, and upon meeting her for the first time, her attitude was firmer than her bones were. You. New kid, she said. What's your name? I paused and immediately drowned in her eyes. Why, I said. Trying to be cool in front of her friends, she said. Are you going to play this game and help us win, or are you just going to sit there? For a split second, I got mad. But I just said to her blankly, I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out which of the two good arms I want to use to roll these dice. Her friend laughed. I got an eye roll. Somehow I rolled snake eyes without touching the dice. You have to understand. I didn't talk much. People came to me. I figured out at a young age that the more I spoke, the more I just didn't want to. It's just better to listen, I guess. Lesson learned. Don't play the game. On to sixth grade. We travel by the breeze in the daytime and by the yellow glow of streetlights in the night. October. The one who gets away. Every year. She always speaks softly and frees you from the grip of a fiery summer and the embers of September. When her time is up, she lets you know when she ends up floating by you and leaves herself scattered throughout the grid. Before you realize it, she's gone. Then it snows. I have a fond memory of one of those October days with an old friend, Nick. Nick was the type of person to ask your birthday, count back nine months, and say, you were conceived in... Ew, yo, your parents, fuck? Then laugh hysterically because you put the image of your parents in your head, all while moaning, way too loud, in public. Classic. Nick was always spontaneous and up to something. He was the kid your mom didn't like you hanging around because he knew too much for his age. But it was fine. I learned a lot. Everyone needs a Nick in their life. The plan for the day was simple. Get Arizonas and some Skittles from 7-Eleven and call it an autumn day well spent. The cans could fit in our hoodie pockets and the rainbow could be in our hands, always on the ready to throw the orange ones at the street signs for competition. Fuck the orange ones. They looked cool flying against the deep blue sky that was lined with those clouds that looked like a thousand nukes had gone off in the distance. Somehow, knocking for a girl became the plan. I didn't know her, but Nick claimed to have been friends with her, and she lived close to our center of the earth 7-Eleven. We were cutting through our grid via an alley between two sets of row homes when the sun was fully awake. 
At the end of the alley were two girls walking towards us. One blended in with the concrete, and the other had a blue arm and a bright wiffle ball bat in her other hand. I'm still dumbfounded that the girl Nick wanted to knock for came to us. No call, no telepathy, no nothing. The universe got me, but now I understand how she works. The girl with the blue arm was smaller than I remembered. Her hair was more of a beautiful mess that day, and I must say that she looked quite pretty. I mean it in the least creepy way possible. I just couldn't stop looking at her, but there isn't a non-creepy way to say it, so bear with me. There's a fine line between romantic and creepy. Too fine to walk on. I got a sense Nick was into her because he wouldn't shut the fuck up about her until we ran into her. I didn't know Nick liked blondes, but I guess he liked girls with the same color hair as him. He would never tell anyone, but he thought redhead girls were God's gift to mankind. In 2010, you couldn't say that to your friends because you get bullied for liking girls with no souls. Strange time. I must have made an impression on the girl with the blue arm at the end of fifth grade because she talked to me the whole day like we had been friends in a past life. We didn't have a plan where to go, but the open field, the wasteland, as Nick called it, in the middle of our grid seemed fair enough. The wasteland was a giant, shitty, rectangular clusterfuck of natural everyday degradation surrounded by a ten foot high rusted fence that was always unlocked, all the way around. Mrs. O'Brien would have loved this place. It belonged to the high school local to the grid. A lot of the row home kids went there. I didn't. I live in a twin. We never went too far from home. The wasteland sat below a massive hill we all stood on. Before the playground, way up in the far right corner, were crooked goalposts and a shitty baseball field to mark the end of the wasteland. We had to enter from the bottom left corner of this rectangle in hopes to reach the playground. The school sat off to the right, running perpendicular to where we entered, and the grid's row homes encompassed three out of four sides. There were steps that led from the sidewalk down, but running down the hill was a better option. Sometimes, if you were in the wasteland on a hot August day, the playground's bright red slide would ripple from the heat and almost seemed like an illusion. The blue monkey bars and black play castle would just melt, but not the slide. It was a glimmer of light in a colorless ocean. Every time I spoke, the girl with the blue arm hit me with a wiffle ball bat. After precise calculation, I took the bat and ran away with it. She chased me through the wasteland for her back, and through all of this I learned that girls have a superpower that lets them run at mock speed and flip-flops. She tackled me, beat me with a bat, and we spent the rest of the afternoon at the playground. All day, her and I insulted each other, and every time I said something smart, I got hit with that bat. Her and I bonded way too well. When the sun was ready for bed, we decided to head home and cut back through the wasteland. In the distance, there was a man walking next to a dog. And as we got closer, the dog started galloping towards me, and I heard the faint words of, Who's that? Go get him, girl. I knew it to be my father's voice, and the dog coming to me was my own. I didn't even realize. My eyes are shit. Sorry. My dog immediately ran over to the girl with the blue arm, jumped on her, and licked her face like she wasn't beating the shit out of me with a bat for six hours. Maybe they were together in a past life. As my father approached us, he said very sternly, Nick, how we doing? He turned to me and said, Who's this? Still giggling with my dog, she said, Ellie. Nice to meet you. 
I love your dog. Thank you, said my father. Feel free to walk her home, because I'm going for a run. Here's her leash. See you for at the dinner table. With a nod, he slowly disappeared through the wasteland and went to the track behind the high school. I don't know why, but Ellie kept talking to my dog in that weird, shitty baby talk voice. If you had known my dog for a week, you would have seen through the bullshit and that my dog only saw new people as a potential for some food. I wasn't fooled. Some years later, that high school got some dollars and drained it on the wasteland. Now it's a massive turf, soccer, football, baseball, frisbee, who gives a fuck field. It looks beautiful, but the gates to get in are always locked. It's not even a wasteland. It's a bro's paradise. Lesson learned. Walk the dog. Onward we went. I don't remember when, but Ellie and Nick left on their separate paths sometime later. Nick has a few kids now and moved down south. Ellie left on a foggy Sunday night in Florida, right in the middle of freshman year of high school. She's pregnant now, and I ponder on what she'll name her child. And never say goodbye when she left. Part of me resents her for not saying it either, but it is what it is. I often wonder what that conversation would have been like, given our history. She was very kind to me, and we shared many moments that are crucial to adolescence. When she left for Florida, she got to start over. All these years later, I found out from her best friend that she was abused by her uncle, which is why she left. I never knew. Had I have known, perhaps our hugs would have lasted longer and been tighter. Our phone calls would have lasted seven hours instead of five, and I would have said many different things. Now I understand why she left in the middle of the night. Be careful with people. In spite of everything, don't be a dick. Always hug like it's the last one you'll ever give. Always. Always say goodbye. Lesson learned. I can't remember the last time she saw my dog, but that day in the wasteland was the first. In sixth grade, we used to get breakfast before school. She'd walk past school to my house, and we would eat dippy eggs my parents would make us. That's how she became known as Eggs with Ellie between my parents and I. Sometimes I bring her up to my dad, just to hear him say it. He's creative like that. My father is a very stoic man, and if you don't know anything about stoicism, odds are it is what it is. If he lived in my grid, you'd always see him walking my dog for miles and miles like a hermit. What people like my father won't tell you is that When they say they don't want anything, odds are they really do. This is the same man who didn't want a dog. But, you know, his wife and seven-year-old son did, so he was outnumbered in that decision. A man knows when he's been beat, so we got the dog. We drove up into the hills to get her. The same man who didn't want the dog had to be there with his son when the time came for her to be put to rest. When my father was a child, he had to put his dog, Whiskers, down by himself. His father was working way too late in the morning that day, and his mother waited outside the vet. His father buried Whiskers out back their house in the rocket box he had from the army. Some years later, his father built a shed over Whiskers by accident. When the time came for my dog, we all died in the vet's office. 
I didn't say a word the whole time. My father would have stopped talking to the dog, saying, It's okay. You're the best girl. We'll see you at the dinner table. That killed me. My father doesn't speak softly, but he did that day. In the mornings, I wake up and I think I hear her howling at people. When I come home, I hear her howling for me to come in. At least she kept the house safe for me all day. I owe her that much. Saying goodbye isn't the hard part. It's the agony of anxiousness for waiting to see them again. Everyone's always rushing. You can never give me a solid reason as to why people run through life. There are things to be learned. Fields to run through, arms to be broken, and things to be felt. One minute an angel is beating you with a bat, and the next minute you're sitting in your car, pondering on how a dog was what tied everything together. Everyone's gone now. This is how it is. Somewhere, as I sit in the rain, There's a war waging in someone, a missed call being returned. Birth, burial, and a tired, old man finally going inside after a few minutes of reflection in the rain. Lesson learned.